Welcome. We are so excited. We have an opportunity to teach you more about the Universal Model today. And today we have an opportunity to hear from a good friend of ours, Nate. Actually, he, today it was the first time we've actually met, right? Yeah, other than the hours of questions. Yes, yes. So uh, besides online and, and through the phone and so forth. Uh, so I'm real excited for Nate. Um, he's a unique individual in that uh, not only is he a truth seeker, but he has the opportunity to influence young people. Being a science teacher in high school now, uh, it's a secondary class at a boys' school. Secondary class. Okay, yeah. So he's he, he's around children. He has an opportunity to to uh, help them understand the world around us. Now, <clears throat> this is obviously important for everybody, but. But our future is the children. And, and he and I had conversations here in the past, and I could tell immediately that not only is he a truth seeker, but uh, he really gets the importance of the universal model. And he's rather new to it, actually. But he's focused his time on the fossils. And, and answers come from questions, right? That's a UM quality that Nate has been really, really good because he's asked me dozens and dozens and dozens of questions, which I know now that he has the answers that he's growing and growing and growing in that. So I've been very impressed with his uh, research and his questions, and I know today you're going to have a really uh, fun time with um, his presentation. So come on up here, Nate, and let's give him a hand. All right, thank you. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, Dean. But, well, I think everybody here is from the West, and I don't think I'm going to get too many people trying to debate me, you know, during this hour. But if you want to, that's okay, too. Um, so, like Dean said, I, was, uh, I, I teach uh, on a secondary level, and I gave a version of this. I can't throw in all the religious references that I want to, but I gave a, a version to it to students yesterday. And um, I heard students were saying, gosh, this is kind of always how I felt was right, you know, with some of the questionability of evolution, but they'd never heard it from anybody. It was just their feelings. And my heart kind of broke thinking, good luck. I hope you figure it out because I can't do everything and, and you're not going to hear this everywhere. So um, I... I'd be happy to email you slides. If you're interested in that, I'll put the email address up again at the end of the presentation. Um, this is basically a Reader's Digest version of the Chapter 11 on fossil formation from Dean's book and some stuff from the Chapter 12 on evolution, which is about uh, the stuff that's related to fossils. I took some stuff from there, too. Um, so, yeah, be not conformed to the world, uh, Romans says. And, you know, we're going to try to figure out how to do that. So you can see this little picture here, fossils. Um, I'm assuming that you guys know they're rocks, okay? They used to be organi organic stuff, you know, bones, trees, and whatnot, but now they're rocks. So scientists have a really hard time explaining how that happened, okay? So um, Dean asked me to share a little bit about my story. So I went to BYU, and I debated lots of professors uh, in dark smoke-filled rooms, just kidding. <laughs> no. um, but uh, anyway, the things that I would hear from them were God used evolution, just accept it, isn't that wonderful? And the prophets are wrong, okay? They said, uh, they, they said uh, this one chemistry professor, he said, you know, the Catholics, they, their doctrine is that the Pope is always right, but nobody really believes the Pope is always right. And then the Mormons, they're backwards. They, the doctrine is that the prophet's not always you know, infallible, but everyone believes he is. And so they were trying to tell me, look, just because the prophets said these, you know, I'm like, hey, I've got 50 pages of quotes of prophets saying evolution is bogus. And they say, well, you know, who cares? We're, we're, we don't have to worry about that. Um, and then, of course, they'll tell you evolution's the only way. All the scientists and academic journals will prove that. Um, and that scriptures have nothing to do with temporal things. So all of this made me feel really bad. And I had a really crazy experience trying to figure out, you know, all of it. And then I was, you know, I 
nobody told me this, but there's such a thing as a creation scientist, and there's tons of evidence about it. And Dean is the only person I've really found that's in the church that's driving that. And he, I was talking to him the other day, and, and I was, I, uh, he said, yeah, most of the stuff in the textbooks now is 90% wrong. But uh, in the creation scientists, they're doing a lot of good work. Their books are only about 50% wrong. Uh, and so Dean's books are z super awesome. I think it's uh, very inspired, to say the least, uh, that they're coming out right now, and super grateful. Um, and I would just say that, uh, so evolution is basically a state religion. We're going to get into fossils in a second, but um, this professor says evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. It's a religion. It always has been. Um, and so the main question you're going to get is if religion's not true, if evolution's not true, why isn't there alternatives in academic journals and professors, full-time professors that are against this? And the answer is, well, they're all banned. It's the same reason that in the Soviet Union, you wouldn't find a capitalist professor. You know, he would probably be banned and maybe killed. You know, thankfully, they don't kill us, but... Okay. Um, you've, this quote was brought up in a lecture earlier today. So suffice it to say, President Nelson isn't buying evolution. He says, man's always been a man. Switching species is just incomprehensible. It just doesn't work. Um, so this is from the BYU packet on evolution. When you take an evolution class at BYU, they gave you this packet, and it says... Hey, uh, read this, you know, there's some controversy, but uh, anyway, the first presidency said, our religion isn't hostile to real science, that which is demonstrable. Um, so we're going to go through this, and we're going to ask ourselves if this is demonstrable science, okay? Um, this is really cool. This is the great evolution experiment with dogs. Um, just to point out, uh, with President Nelson's thing that he was saying, we don't see that changing. And then I was talking to my a friend, I'll say a friend about this, and they said, well, yeah, because you haven't waited millions of years. That's why you haven't seen a new species evolve. You just haven't waited long enough. This can't be tested in a lab. How are you going to say that, oh, we've never seen a new species evolve, so therefore, you know, they say that's not a good argument. But here's the thing. Science is about what you can prove. If you can't prove it, it's not really science. And so to say that, well, you need to wait a million years. Well, tell me who's waited a million years, okay? So that just, it doesn't work. And this scientist, down quote at the bottom, it says, a set of ideas that cannot be, in principle, falsified is not science. So we're not just looking for falsehoods. We're looking for truth. And, but if you can't test it to see if it's true, it's not a valid scientific argument. So the millions of years is fairy tale. Okay, nobody's seen it. And that's another awesome lesson that Dean's taught me. I'll ask him this question, and he'll be like, Nate, who's seen that happen? Uh, he says, nobody. And that's the great measuring rod for science, is science is all about proof. So anyway, um, we've tried this great evolution experiment with dogs. You breed dogs thousands of years, you're going to get endless variety, but you're never going to get a new species. Okay, that's the point there. Um, these pigeons, you're getting lots of cool pigeons here, but they're still birds, okay? Um, and actually, the cool thing is, is you leave this, leave these birds in nature. You're not artificially inseminating and forcing them to breed with so-and-so to make such and such. You leave them to themselves in nature, and they're going to revert back to their prototypical species. So, very cool. Um, so, this is another really important thing, okay? This is the tree of life. This shows that we all came from a common ancestor, like some small germ. And so you've traced this tree. The outer ring is the species that we've identified in nature. Okay, we name them all. But you'll notice on the inner rings, okay, right here, there's no labels to those. And that's because they don't exist. Okay? Um, and what we're going to find out is that scientists are obsessed with showing that missing link but it just never, ever happens. They can't find the darn missing link. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out that's that a fun story, um, that they're always, whenever you kind of bring up 
that, yeah, the, the fossil argument is trash, um, as we're going to try to continue to do over the next few minutes. They'll, in these debates, they'll say, okay, well, we don't even really need the fossils anymore. Look at, the, look at this over here. And there's this famous story about this evolutionary plant biologist. He spends his whole career studying the biology and the evolution of plants. And he said, well, what's the best evidence for evolution in your opinion? And the answer was the whale pelvis. Okay. So I guess nothing was convincing in his field of science. So he had to point over there. And that's what always happens. You ask this department and say, well, I'll tell you the best evidence. This guy over here, and you go over there, well, that guy. So it's a shell game, to say the least. So no common ancestors, okay? This scientist says the rooting of universal tree is hopelessly compromised. So a little bit on human bio, uh, evolutionary biology, okay? So we want to, you know, we have this idea that the, uh, I don't know if this thing comes off. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. We have this idea that we go and we look in the fossil bed and we can find, okay, here's great-great-grandpa Johnny and great-grandpa Joey and finally me. And that as you get up in the layers higher and higher, this is what you're seeing. But uh, again, here's a scientist. He says, we want to see this linear progression, bipedalism development. But evolution doesn't evolve toward anything, really. It's a messy affair full of diversity and dead ends. Down here, you've got these cool-looking Neanderthal people. Um, what you do here is you find a skeleton, and then you pay somebody to make something. And they say, okay, what do you want? I can, I, you, you name it, I make it. And so they say, make him look ape-like. And that's what you get. They look ape-like, because it's very artistic rendering. So did those skeletons that make those Neanderthals, did they have the hair? Did they show all this? No, of course not. So this is, you know. Um, so the human family of species are arranged in an orderly procession from uh, primitive forms up to modern man, but such scenarios are subjective and very unscientific. Again, over here, a professor at Columbia University, a detailed continuous record of transition between species is missing, which is exactly what Darwin called for. He said, we have to have this gradual account. So if life evolves from nothing, we're starting here in tiny stuff, and it gets bigger and bigger as you go, right? Okay, well, that's just... You can't find that. It doesn't exist. And I think we're going to talk about geologic column in a minute. Um, geologic column is coming. But uh, suffice it to say that the geologic column is only in textbooks and museums. And uh, you're just not going to find it. So this is something interesting. So when did, when did uh, fossils form? The answer is millions of years ago. Uh, you're reading your textbook millions of years ago. Okay. So here's some questions to think about. You guys can recognize that, okay? You've got some kind of crawfish, and you've got a wasp here. You've got some ferns. Um, these guys look a whole lot like their modern counterparts, right? So why haven't they evolved over millions of years? Well, the human species, we've evolved over millions of years, certainly. Humans have been around, this, our particular variety of humans have been around for 60,000 years, according to the theory, uh, which is about 2,000 generations. Another interesting thing is bacteria. 45,000 generations later, it's kind of easy to track them, they're still bacteria. Yet in 2,000 generations, we changed. So there's a lot of problems, right? A lot of problems. So I will tell you the resolution of the mystery. These were not formed a long time ago. And what we're going to talk about is that fossils aren't forming all the time. It was actually a unique environment for fossils to form. It was the universal flood. And these guys were fossilized a few thousand years ago. So another big thing is, you know, hey, we've got the proof that we evolved from lower life forms and primates because we've got the skeletons that are half man, half monkey. But what we're finding is that usually these finds are skeletons of children, they're skeletons of monkeys, or they're skeletons of pygmies. So these are four foot tall pygmies. They're very smart. Just because they're small doesn't mean they're incompetent. Okay. Um, now, so we've got this Indonesian find. It's called the Hobbit Skull in the Liang Bua Cave, 2004. So um, this was, uh, these were, the thing was this, this was not fossils. These were just bones. So remember, the difference between a fossil and a bone is a fossil is a rock. It's a bone that turned into rock. Okay. Now, What's special about these just being bones? It means they're not that old. 
bones decay, okay? They're not gonna sit around for millions of years, okay? Usually bones just waste away. So if we found in this, uh, this was strikingly similar to the Lucy fossils, that Lucy is the missing link, right? One of the missing links between monkeys and humans. Well, why do we have skeletons that look exactly like Lucy that are only a couple thousand years old and they live next door to these pygmies? Well, the answer is that they are skeletons of pygmies, okay? Um, yeah. um, so a few more bogus Neanderthal finds. At the top here, this quote uh, says, um, False record has been deemed particularly chaos of anthropological nomenclature, and critics have deemed the conventions of human paleology to, uh, particularly permissive. In other words, Houston, we have a problem. Don't talk about fossils when you're promoting evolution. Okay. So Piltdown Man, this was a hoax. It was the jawbone of orangutan mixed with a jaw with a skull of a human. Um, everyone threw a party because this was finally the missing link. And 40 years later, oops, take that out of your textbook. It's a fraud. This happens over and over. Nebraska man was a tooth of a pig. Oh, eventually take that out of your textbook. Hilton man, he was uh, filed down teeth, um, jaw was broken, kind of disset. Um, yeah, another fraud. Um, and an interesting thing about Lucy is the guy who found Lucy, from what I hear, was two weeks away from running out of grant money on a mission to find the missing link. So good for him. He, he fortunately was able to pull it off right before his grant money ran out. He found the missing link. So you guys are familiar with um, the Book of Moses. Um, Harold B. Lee threw down with the Book of Moses. Somebody says, Harold B. Lee, what about the science? What about the Neanderthals? He says, Book of Moses says, Adam was the first living soul, first flesh upon the earth, first man also. And of course, Bruce McConkie will tell you in plain English that uh, it's the evolution of species diametrically opposes um, the doctrine of the fall. And again, I have... 50 pages of those quotes, and it gets, you know. Um, Book of Mormon says, man in the beginnings made in the image of God. And again, Book of Mormon says, man must, all these living things must have remained forever if something didn't happen. So we've got an issue if you've been dying for a million of years and then going to Eden. Um, okay, this is Georges Cuvier. He was the father of paleontology. And, you know, scientists back in the day, they believed the flood caused a giant catastrophe that uh, made the fossils, etc. He said, he looked at the fossils and he says, these didn't gradually change from one to another. Um, so you'll find that a lot of these scientists, the, now, but of course science got infiltrated and it became really unpopular to blame a flood for these things. And of course now, you know, there wasn't a flood at all, right? But anyway, uh, William Smith, he's a canal surveyor, which, you know, is, uh, but uh, Dean points out that's kind of crazy that this is kind of the guy they built off their foundation that all the layers it says they always succeed one another in the same order and then this Columbia University professor he says thanks to this guy thanks to William Smith we now know that fossils became the key that allowed geologists to identify the relative ages and sequences of rock layers regardless of their location in other words we find this fossil, and we know this fossil is this old, so this layer is this old. Anyway, it's sketchy, to say the least. Um, this is Galileo, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Lawrence Cross. Cross says, science is about proving things not to be true, but proving them to be false. Okay, there's some truth to that, but there's also deception to that. Because science is about proving things to be false, and proving things to be true. Okay, so there's a big relativism thing going on in modern, you know, philosophy that says, yeah, nothing's really true anyway. Um, Galileo, this is one of my new favorite quotes. He says, all truths are easy to understand. Once they're discovered, the point is to discover them. So a real scientist is trying to discover laws of nature. And that's what scientists used to be doing. They used to be, hey, uh, you know, this is so amazing. And look at the exact order that everything's going in. Wow, God... This is amazing. Um, whereas, you know, that's totally not the approach anymore, which is tragic. And it's tragic that you can't, you know, you, sh you should be able to talk about that in a school, but it gets, it gets nasty. Um, this, is, this is James Hutton. He says, you know what? It wasn't a flood. 
it was just the same thing going on forever and ever and exactly the same. They called it uniform theory, uniformitarian. And, you know, this, um, this is what the Bible warned against. He says, in the last days there will come scoffers who say, where is the promise of Christ's coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They're willingly ignorant. Okay? It also talks about the flood right there, being overflowed with water, perished. So, um, willingly ignorant sounds like conspiracy to me. It's like they know something's going on, but they're going to push this anyway because they have an agenda. Um, yeah, the brainwashing is pretty deep these days. I think, I, I'm glad, you know, I, it's, it's pretty crazy. I don't blame, you know, I'm not personally attacking people, and especially the, you know, the rising generation who, who falls for all this because it's all they have. It's, there's no alternatives presented. Um, so this is geologic column stuff. This is fun. This is what it's supposed to be like. X fossil is an X layer. If you find X fossil, it's X layer. And then they turn it around too. They say, if you find X layer, the fossil that's in it is that because so. Um, obviously that's circular reasoning. You can't define the fossil by the layer and at the same time define the layer by the fossil. I remember when I took a geology course at university, they said, you know, some people say it's circular reasoning that we base the rocks off the dirt and we base the dirt off the rocks when it comes to ages. Write us a, you know, give a presentation on why that's not true. Well, nobody could pull it off. We all just came up with circular reasoning and it was, you know, we all got an A, I guess, but um, the professor was happy enough. Richard Dawkins. He's one of the most dogmatic uh, theoretical physicists, uh, biological evolutionists. He says, we seldom find a complete historical record as we dig down through the rocks, as in never, actually. So all fossils are shallow, okay? This blew my mind when I, when I found this out. One example I like to point out is this Kennecott mine in Utah. This is um, the deepest open pit mine. It's a mile deep, so we're talking like 8,000 feet. So, does anyone want to guess how deep the fossils were? Because they did find fossils. Okay. It was the first 70 feet. Yeah. So, that top little, you know, there ain't no fossils back past that. So, this blows it away. Obviously, you know. So, so what's up with no fossils except for the top layer? Okay. So, for one, this means if we're not finding fossils below mainly the surface, you know, not more than 100 feet, um, and typically much less than that. Usually it's like one foot, okay? Um, so usually when we find fossils, we're excavating a construction site, and lo and behold, there's a T-Rex. Very great day, I found a T-Rex. And uh, so this is interesting because if you go down deeper and deeper, you should find simpler and simpler life until the most simple because life evolved from small, simple things and it became more complex. But, okay, so they go down to where, you know, the, where they say, okay, well, there's, you know, there's going to be, at this layer, the Precambrian, we're going to find uh, Paleosol, we're going to find this uh, little, little forms of life where life began and go up from there. Uh, well, it says, uh, in uh, soils of the past, no well-preserved microfossils have been demonstrated unequivocally to have lived in the Precambrian Paleosol. The existence of life on land as far back as 3,000 million years thus remains not only reasonable speculation, but also an idea amiable to further testing from the fossil record of the soils. So they're pretty stumped. Why aren't they finding what they're supposed to find? The Grand Canyon is the other big hitter. There's no fossils in the Grand Canyon. Holy cow. The Grand Canyon is the most studied thing ever. So the Grand Canyon is this showcase of, hey, we didn't have to dig. Thank you. We just split it open, you know, and actually we're going to suggest instead of a river carving that, it was a large earthquake. And uh, we can see in there, oh boy, we're going to finally find these missing fossils. Oh, tragic. We didn't find them. Okay. The only place you find fossils in the Grand Canyon is the surface. Okay. So what we're going to get into is uh, the story of why, because I'm showing you a lot of things that aren't true. And if you're like me, you're saying, okay, well, what is true? Tell me what is true. Tell me what happened. And we're going to get into that. Um, so first, so here's all the fossils that should be found in the Grand Canyon. In each of these layers, this guy's going to be here. Nope, he's not. This guy's going to be here. Nope, he's not. Nope, 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 nope. Um, so you have all these scientists, you know, saying, no one's ever found a fossilized reptile or skeleton, reptile skeleton or bone within the Grand Canyon. Fossil footprints by a few, but no teeth or bones. The sandstone in the Grand Canyon, strangely enough, 
no bones. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about a little bit of why. Okay, Colorado Plateau, Grand Canyon, here's what happened. So, um, the, basically, you, when you're talking about the flood, you don't even have to bring up religion anymore, it's so obvious. In Dean's first book, he talks about 200 evidences that the flood was everywhere. And something I'm going to leave you with today is that when you go and ask your friend, and your friend says, hey, well, you know, so-and-so says it was a local flood, you say, okay, well, here's how fossils are formed and so forth. And so now, anywhere you find a fossil, the flood was there. And even the sand dunes, those are, micros those are, those are really small quartz crystals formed from the flood hypertherm that some of you are aware of as well. So anywhere you find sand dunes, Sahara Desert, everywhere, the flood was there. So there's, again, there's hundreds of those evidences, and it becomes, you know, super easy. So, okay, when the flood happens, fountains from the deep break open. Um, comet, the, a really good theory that Dean presents is that comet goes by the Earth, interrupts the centrifugal and gravity forces keeping the Earth in balance, which causes just enough change to tweak things to where we're getting some crushing happening on the Earth, which means you've got... Uh, lots of stuff coming out from under the earth. This includes massive amounts of sand, okay? So you're getting these deposits, these deposits of the Grand Canyon and the mountains and such. They're happening, uh, it knows Genesis says the flood and all its ramifications was around for about a year. So within a year time frame, you're getting the layers of deposits. Okay, you've got all this water flying around, all these jets of water and sands from deep in the earth, and they're depositing these things. That's another reason why there's no fossils in them. There's some footprints, because some people are saying, hey, you see what I'm saying? This is not looking good. We've got to get out of here. So those are where we get some, some footprints. And, um, and that's another mystery we're going to talk about in a second, is no one can explain why footprints turn into fossils uh, because they don't understand the hypertherm situation, which is unique, that preserves stuff. Okay? God's signature. Fossils are God's signature, that he judged the world. And uh, it's no wonder that Satan attacks true science so much because science proves God and proves the Bible. So, um, so yeah, we talked about that. Um, so when you're talking about fossils, uh, there's a very unique recipe to make a fossil, okay? So 99% of fossils are quartz, and you're not just going to get quartz any old day. According to your textbook, you, uh, the animals die here and there. Grandpa dies, grandpa got sick, and... Uh, you know, Johnny ran out of food and lost the fight. So every now and then you're getting some dying. And maybe there's some rains. Maybe the occasional mud washes in. Long story short, uh, Johnny gets buried. And, you know, subsidence. Millions of years later, he's just kind of sitting around in the dirt. And he turns into a fossil. But how does it happen? So there's no mechanism to explain how the um, silica gets into the cellular structure of the wood or the bones, according to the current theory. Um, yeah, so the average temperature and pressure on Earth's surface does not contribute to silica saturation, much above six parts per million in typical groundwater. At such low concentrations, only microscopic quartz uh, crystals could form, which are not even large enough to cement or silt sand grains into stone. So you're just not getting the recipe. The recipe for fossils is not happening in what they're saying happened. The slow, gradual, Johnny sits there in the dirt for a million years, and at some point he's, you know, so this is what happens when Johnny sits in the dirt for a million years. He gets eat. okay, he gets eaten. His bones decay. Um, yeah, that's pretty obvious. When something dies, okay, the implication of this is where are the fossils forming today? There's not any fossils forming today. Yeah. Um, where's the in-process fossils? There's not any in-process fossils today. Now, according to James Hutton and these guys, the same process that are going on slowly, slowly over all these millions of years are the processes that have been happening to make the fossils. Well, those are still happening today, but something must have been different because there's no fossils forming today. Okay. Um, these guys, these are eggs that turned into fossils, okay? So these eggs are now rocks. You can see the embryos of these dinosaurs and such. There's thousands of these all over the world, um, including recent finds. So, again, rotten eggs, they stink, it happens, and uh, these guys, you know, they're, they're still here. So, how did they wait that long? Well, the answer is the flood happened, it turned them into 
stone, okay? It's really pretty cool. God knew the exact recipe. He knew the exact way to place the comet to disrupt things, to cause the flood. He knew how much water. He knew how much everything. And, and this is his signature, and it's really, really cool. So, yeah, dinosaur eggs fossilized. Big mystery to scientists. Okay, Darwin said, no organism wholly soft can be preserved. So why do we have this feather fossil? Why do we have these jellyfish? Okay, why are there, you know, ripples in the ground that are now turned into rock? And the answer is the same, okay? Modern science has no explanation for this. But when you understand how it really happened, you, um, it becomes pretty clear. And we're going to get more into that. Okay, so footprints. Why do we have footprints turning into fossils? Where are the modern-day footprints turning into fossils? Okay, there are none. Um, the uh, only hyperthermal conditions can fossilize something like a track. Um, the passing animals trying to escape the rising waters walked across the soft clay, leaving behind their tracks to be preserved by the rising hyperthermal waters. And my apologies, I didn't define the word hypertherm. It's a word I believe Dean made. It's hydro, which is water, pre, pressure, and therm, thermal. So the idea is that the recipe for fossils is this perfect combination of amount of pressure and amount of heat and obviously the presence of water, uh, which can silicify these bones. Um, human footprints, this is, this is weird because humans didn't live millions of years ago. Oops. Well, fossils are a million years old, though, so pick one. You can't have both. Um, hundreds recently found in Australia, uh, a few thousand years old. 269 found in Mexico in 2005. 60% of them indisputably human. So they're carbon dated to be 38,000 years. Okay. So that's problematic because they say, you know, in Mexico, humans came here 11,000 years ago. Okay, so now we got some problems on the human migration history too. And then the argon paleomagnetic dated them to be 1.2 million years old. So we got some problems. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so Mount St. Helens is a really good case study because 1980, something happened where most of the scientists say the fossils formed from mud flows, from volcanoes and such. Okay, well, here's your case study. Um, so, question number one, are any of these trees being buried? Okay, are the trunks being preserved? Uh, the answer is no. And you, you could ask the follow-up question, well, Mr. Nate, you just haven't waited long enough. Go back in a million years, and boy, you'll find lots of fossils there. Sorry, but they're all decomposed. They're all gone. There's nothing left to fossilize. Okay, what are you going to fossilize? They're all gone. Volcanoes don't fossilize stuff. Um, okay, so the, is the wood partially, you know, getting solidified? No. Uh, and then do we find the sediments that are, you know, we've, on fossils we find these green, blue sediments from the minerals getting pushed up by the jets. Another thing that's missing. Now, you compare this to Yellowstone. Yellowstone is, you know, this ancient volcano. and It's got tons of fossils, petrified wood. Well, the thing is, Yellowstone, those fossils that we're finding around there, it's not just because there was a volcano. It's because that was, um, those circumstances, those were being things that were preserved at the flood as well. Um, so, again, uh, we've got these standing trees, which is really weird because when a tree dies, it's going to get knocked over easily if it doesn't fall over on its own. And if you've got all this ash and mud flow coming in from a volcano, which supposedly buried this, you're going to knock that thing over. So, standing petrified trees. Okay? Mystery. Not so much, though, when you consider that the fossilization happened at the flood, which you didn't have to wait around to die. It just happened. Right then. Okay. Uh, let's see. This trying to figure out what to do with this one. Uh, there's way too many words on this slide, which is, doesn't make it very fun. But So this is a map of the United States. We're finding fossils of wood everywhere. This is the most common fossil, which is petrified wood. It used to be wood, and now it's a rock. So again, we've talked about how this doesn't really, this isn't happening anywhere today. You can find, uh, you can find this stuff everywhere, but it's not being formed today. Um, we talked about there's not enough Pressure created, uh, so if you have the ash burial theory with the volcano, that doesn't produce enough uh, pressure to uh, activate the quartz crystallization. Um, let's see, and there's a lot of obvious problems here. So we're gonna move on. 
Um, this is another evidence that you've got quartz forming with uh, quartz crystals with this wood here. This is showing that these formed, you know, this is petrified wood. These formed at the same time, okay, in the universal flood hypertherm. And uh, those two being together, the fossilized wood and the fossil quartz, um, is more evidence that these two are created at the same time. Um, the formation of quartz is largely misunderstood, and that's another story for another time. Another idea is that this was made by groundwater leaching. This is petrified wood. But again, remember the, the pressure that you get from uh, the, where we find these things. It just simply isn't enough pressure to turn this into quartz. Okay. So no known process related to groundwater leaching can actually do this. But they're just puzzled. and They've got to put something in the book of how this happens. So they just say, yeah, groundwater leaching. This is uh, petrified wormwood. These trees, okay, they have the same minerals nearby as metamorphic neighbors, suggesting um, they were both made uh, in the similar condition. So this tree, you can see the tree rings and everything. These are boreholes into it from the bugs, and they've got filled in with these minerals that are the same as this rock next door, right by it, that's uh, supposedly metamorphic. But what you're going to find is that a lot of these metamorphic are actually hypertherm creation. So uh, this is petrified ore wood. So how did this wood, you know, get this way? Um, so around the Grand Canyon, you've got over 200 uranium pipes. They're leftover hydro fountains that had some rocks solidify where those hydro fountains were. Bacteria from deep in the earth shot up when the fountains of the deep opened. This wood was exposed to the same ores as we find deep in the earth. The bottom came out through the hydro fountains in the flood. Okay, so um, so now a couple things about the flood. So obviously, you know, if you're gonna take Genesis at its word, it was worldwide. Okay, all that was under the whole heaven was covered. Um, it was the waters were taller than the mountains. All the flesh on the earth died, not just the local flood, right? Not just the local flesh. Uh, every living substance was destroyed and the waters prevailed upon the earth. It means the waters won. If you prevail, it means you won. So here's uh, Dean's, you know, okay, okay. So if the fossils were made in the flood, what caused the flood? So this is the idea here. The, you know, you've got the centrifugal force of the outward pushing from the spinning and such, the gravitational uh, force pulling things back. And so if the, we have a comet that passes by, it disrupts that just enough to where you're gonna get the crust, uh, continental crust, and ocean and crust submerging. So you've got floodwaters, not just from rain. Uh, Book of Noah says fountains broke open, okay? Fountains of the deep. So uh, again, and like you saw Rod talking about earlier today, there's uh, so much evidence that this is mostly a water planet. And so if you've got continents going down, well, maybe the ocean waters are gonna boom, tidal wave covering you. And then you've also got stuff spewing out from underneath. You've also got some rain. Um, so again, this is the magic recipe. It's it's not magic. It's calculated by God. So um, you've got uh, pressure, okay, and it's 30,000 feet. We'll talk about why. I'm just going to show that actually right now. So Mount Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain from base to peak, more than 33,000 feet. It's about five and six miles, 5.6 miles. So Dean says, okay, the Bible said, you know, I'm I'm going to. I think this is what happened in Dean's head. It's probably a more sophisticated version. Uh, okay, this mountain, okay, about 30,000 feet. The Bible says the mountains were covered. So let's try, uh, you know, he goes down the slide in his basement to Dexter's lab, and he, he tries making fossils, and he actually succeeds, which is really cool. He turned this wood into a rock. Congratulations. And there's other, exp that's what makes Dean a real scientist, right? He's actually doing the experiments, and he's, so, he, he found, okay, what pressure is it, okay? So that's why we're back to here, uh, back to here. So at 30,000 feet, the amount of water pressure, that's about 14,000 PSI, okay? So he says, all right, in my recipe, when I'm gonna make a fossil, I'm gonna turn up the pressure to about 14,000 PSI. And uh, so, yeah, and then the frictional heat, another thing, big thing that uh, really amazing that Dean talks about is that um, when you've got a volcano and there's lava coming out, it's not because there's lava in the middle of the earth, it's because uh, there's an earthquake and those crusts, you know, they rub together. You rub your hands together and it gets warm. You rub billions of pounds of rock together and it liquefies. So you're getting lots of heat here, plenty of heat, 
it, I think it was like 400 Celsius, 650 Fahrenheit it was the was the yeah. Uh, so we've got the right amount of heat. Anyway, so you've got this big pressure cooker thing going on, and the minerals getting shot up from under in the earth. So all these logs that are laying around, all these animals that are laying around, there's the perfect condition for them to turn into a fossil. And there's not the perfect condition in what's going on right now. Okay. So, um, yeah, how deep was the flood? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so here's something kind of fun. The, okay, I need to stop talking in like really soon, like five minutes ago. Let's just uh, say the dinosaurs died in a flood. All these scientists are starting to agree that they don't know it was a big flood, but it was a flood. Uh, I should probably stop talking and just say thank you for your time and uh, thank you, Dean Sessions, for the awesome research. Oh, five more minutes? All right, all right. All right, I'll, t I'll talk for five minutes. So, again, the tsunami's coming in. All the dinosaurs are dying. Uh, the fountains and everybody. Everybody's getting out of Dodge. Okay, they're leaving their footprints. Their footprints are getting solidified. So here's the kind of fun thing is, okay, well, if, di if, if, if the Earth is young and if the dinosaurs lived apparently not in prehistoric and millions of years ago, then I guess they must have lived with humans at some extent, maybe off, probably off in their own camps, but you got everybody talking about it. The word for dinosaur used to be dragon. Book of Job, Josephus, Alexander the Great, Marco Polo, Epic of Gilgamesh, St. George slaying the dragon here. So to some extent, we've got some big lizards that we got to take down. And where did they come from? They must have been around not too long ago. Um, so, yeah, uh, for the fossil to form, you've got to have mineralization, hypertherm. This is a hydrothermal vent. This is the closest we get to, uh, and this is a blue hole that's an ancient uh, hydro fountain. This is the closest we're going to get to where you can make fossils today. If you die and you land on the bottom of the ocean where there's this hydrothermal vent pushing stuff out, you might have a chance of getting partially fossilized. Uh, extremely rare, of course. Uh, but it's a good example of how this worked on a bigger scale. Okay, let's just see if I have any closing thoughts for you guys. Uh, why isn't this eroded more? Why is this tree still intact? You know, it's, it's been sitting there for millions of years. Why is it still so intact? What's up with, the, what's up with that? Again, where's the erosion? Why isn't this eroded? Why aren't these eroded more? These guys just aren't eroded. Uh, scientists are finally coming around. I guess we're going to have to accept, accept some catastrophic theory of why things got wiped out because nothing else would make this preserve so well and the conditions and all this. Okay, I'm going to skip, 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 skip. Amber is a great thing. Um, yeah, so again, uh, Darwin and all his cronies say you shouldn't really, this guy says, you shouldn't really use laws and experiments to demonstrate evolutionary biology history because, you know, but of course that's not science. If you can't do experiments and find laws, you're not really doing science. It's more of a fairy tale. And I suppose that's, uh, let's see, yeah, the Book of Mormon isn't too uh, happy about what's going on. You know, they're uh, foolish is what it says. Okay, thank you.